In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If anybody knows about the goodness, if anybody knows about the
to grace. If anybody knows about the power of the living God, we do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My, my, my. What a presence of the Lord is in this place right now. It's in an atmosphere like this, folks, that God can do anything. You didn't mishear me. I didn't say some things. It's in an atmosphere like this that God can do anything. There's nothing too big for Him. There's nothing beyond His ability. There's nothing beyond His reach. There's no sickness He can't heal. There's no disease He can't heal. There's nobody bound that He can't set free. Mm. My, 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 my. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. When I walked in here tonight, I couldn't help myself. I just began to weep. I felt God so strong in this place. Friend, God's here right now. If I don't get to do nothing else tonight, it, it don't matter to me. But God's here right now. Does anybody in this house believe that? Reach out and touch somebody and tell them, God's here right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You'll have to, you'll have to forgive me. I come here from revival, folks. We've had 259 people filled with the Holy Ghost in our local church. In the last two and a half weeks, we've had three women healed of cancer. Mary Grassle, breast cancer, went to the doctor about two weeks ago. He said, Mary, we've been treating you, but you don't need no more chemo. You don't need no more nothing because it's gone. If it was ever there, it's gone. Melinda Joy went last Monday, lung cancer, sent her to the hospital, told her you're going to be in the hospital or rehab for five weeks. She called me on Tuesday, 24 hours later, said they got in there, put a scope down my throat. They're looking for everything. The doctor said, send this woman back to MRI. There's no cancer in her lungs. She's home. My God, my God, my God, my God. Tori Freeman, colon cancer. Got a little girl so worried about what looked like was an incurable case of cancer. She not only went to the hospital, she went to the state hospitals in Richmond, Virginia, Medical College of Virginia, and the best hospitals in our state. But about three weeks ago, she sent me a graph, and she said, this is what the doctor gave me today. Up here is where my cancer was, and then it went down and down and down. Up here it was point... 18 or something I, I don't remember but way up there and she said today it's zero <laughs> touch somebody and tell them God can do anything God can do anything <laughs> I know you've been having good church I watched the last two nights. I've watched what happened here. I heard what happened here. Mark, you're my buddy. You ain't ever done better in your lifetime than you did last night. God used you, sir. God used you last night. Let me tell you what we ought to be doing after the camp meeting that you had already this week. You ought to be licking the paint off the ceiling. You ought to be dancing. You ought to be shouting. You ought to be running. You ought to be jumping. You ought to be screaming around here. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, yes. 
Yes, yes. I told everybody in our church, I want you to jump up and down. I want you to shout. I want you to get out in the aisle and shout. Shout between the benches. Somebody come to me after church and said, oh, Brother Cunningham, half those people were shouting in the flesh. I said, they don't have nothing else to shout in. You listen to me. If God's got to make you worship, it's not worship. Somebody tells you, oh, I didn't want to do it. The Holy Ghost threw me out in the aisle. And the Holy Ghost made it in worship. If God's got to make you do it. Worship's what I do no matter how I feel. Worship is what I give Him. It's of my own volition. It's by my own will. Some of you that haven't danced for 10 years, you ought to start dancing right now. You ought to dance where you are. You know, the book of Psalms is a book of praise. And all through the book of Psalms, there's only nine ways to worship. Three of them includes your hands. Lift your hands, clap your hands, play skillfully. Three of them include your feet. Run before the Lord, dance before the Lord, leap up and down before the Lord. Three of them include your voice. Sing before the Lord, cry out and shout. Tell of His goodness. Here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't care what you do. Just do something. in the world that's heard better preaching than you've already heard this week. Brother Victor Jackson, Brother Robert Tisdale, Brother Mark Dross, and the incomparable Raymond Woodward teaching every day. All the other men that have preached and taught around this place. Folks, y'all been sitting at a table with a banquet spread. I got a lady in the church that makes me look tiny. But my God, can that woman sing. I took her with me to the New Jersey, Delaware camp meeting. Right before I got up to preach, the district secretary got up to take the Friday night offering. And he said, folks, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. He didn't know I brought Sister Baker with me to sing. 
Well, it ain't over tonight. There's people that didn't get healed last night that's going to be healed tonight. There's people that need delivered emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, maritally, family-wise, that your miracle is in this house. I put out a tweet this week that said there just simply isn't no other camp like Louisiana camp. I'm telling you, there's no, there's just something special about this place and what God does here. You've always been blessed with great leadership. Probably some of the greatest leaders that have ever lived have superintended this district. But there's never been a better one than the one you got right now. He's a man of God. Now don't you worry about brother and sister Tenney because that's the way they feel about him. Hello? I thank God for your superintendent. I thank God for the leadership of this district. Everybody say, what a mighty God we serve. serve. Say it again, what a mighty God we serve. I felt like God spoke to me last week. I was in New York. I felt like God spoke to me coming home from New York to go on a fast. And I've been fasting several days from then till now about this service tonight. It was while I was coming home from New York that God began to deal with me about men and women of God, pastors, their spouses, and their family. Now, that's not why they invited me. They invite me because they want me to help people get the Holy Ghost and pray for sick folks, and we'll do that. But you've been having that for the last three nights. And when I watched the last two services, it just made me feel good that I didn't have to worry about doing something other than what I felt in the Holy Ghost tonight. I want every pastor in this place to know I've been praying for you. I want every man of God here to know I've been interceding in the Holy Ghost for you. I want every pastor of every church to know you're not on your own. You're not by yourself. You're not underqualified. The devil's not going to win. The enemy's not going to destroy you. The enemy's not going to destroy your marriage. The enemy's not going to destroy your ministry. The enemy's not going to destroy your church. But God's going to bring you through. You're going to have the victory. God's going to give you strength. God's going to empower you. My, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 said, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe? According to the working of His mighty power, say mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places, far above all, principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and he hath put all things say all things that's your marriage that's your unsaved children that's your finances that's the emotional pressure you're under and he hath put all things under his feet and gave unto him to be the head over all things to the church holler that's us which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all say what a mighty god we serve touch three or four people and tell them what a mighty god we serve
Now I've got a tall order for you before you're seated. Everybody listen at me. Before you're seated, on this Friday night, after days and nights of powerful moves of God and powerful worship, for the next two minutes, I want you to praise God harder than you have praised God all year long. Close your eyes. Focus your attention on Him. Forget about what everybody else is doing. And I want you to empty yourself out in praise before Him. Empty yourself out in praise before God. What a mighty God we serve! You got another minute. Give it all you got. Give it all you got. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all, all, all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Oh, there's no reason to stop. Do it again. Do it again. There are things being broken in the Holy Ghost while you worship. God is breaking down walls while you worship. Yes, 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 yes. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That's the highest praise you can give him. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. My, 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 my. Before I start preaching, let me tell you that the most powerful apostolics among us have this in common. They worship no matter what they're going through. I didn't say all of us. I said the most powerful apostolics among us worship no matter what they're going through. I saw a brother... Cox call on our good buddy brother Greg down here tonight and he was talking about how God healed him. We all know that Greg has been to the very gate of hell and back and he's up here tonight. He's not sitting back there. He's not back there with his arms crossed because all great apostolics have this in common. They worship God no matter what they're going through. No matter what the enemy throws at them. No matter how hard things are. No matter who's talking about them. No matter who's walked out on them. They worship God. Go ahead, sis. I found out that apostolics will stand up in the middle of a mess and magnify God. The devil don't know what to do with people. Who worship God in the middle of a storm. The devil don't know what to do with people that worship God when they're sick. 
Devil don't know what to do with people that worship God when they're suffering or where they're under attack or where they've suffered a horrible loss. The devil just simply don't know what to do with you when you make your mind up. I'm going to magnify God no matter what I'm going through, no matter how I feel. I'm going to glorify and magnify the King of Kings. Now forgive me, they've already paid me, and I ain't giving it back. Forgive me, you can pretend like you don't know about this, but y'all remember Rocky? Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, Rocky 5, I think they're up to about 48 now or something like that. But you know what was amazing about Rocky? It didn't matter if he was fighting that great big old Russian that looked like he was three foot taller than him. It didn't matter if he was fighting Mr. T, that when he hit you, it's like getting hit with a pile of bricks. What Mr. T and the Russian couldn't figure out was when old Rocky stumbled back to his corner and sat down there. I mean, his face is beaten to a bloody pulp. He can hardly walk, and he's in the corner. And when the bell rings, he back up on his feet, back out there fighting. And Mr. T and the Russian is telling their corner, I can't figure out why is he getting back up why don't he stay down when I hit him why does he get back up after I give him a good shot can I tell you the devil don't understand you being at camp meeting the devil can't figure out why you decided to come here and worship he's telling all of hell I gave him a good shot they ought to be down for the count they ought not be worshiping God they shouldn't be magnifying God they shouldn't be running the aisles they shouldn't be dancing in the spirit I'm telling you, sometimes the enemy hits us and he literally makes us reel back and forth on our heels. He knocks the breath out of us. There's times the enemy comes in like a flood and the Bible tells us that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God's going to raise up a standard against him. But there's times, honey, before God can ever raise up the standard, you've got to endure the devil coming in like a flood. You've got to make your mind up that when my nose is barely above the floodwaters, when I'm barely able to breathe, when I'm standing on my tiptoes trying to make it, all I got to do is keep worshiping God. All I got to do is keep magnifying God. devil don't know what to do with a child of God that worships no matter how they feel anybody anybody ought to be able to worship God if you drove a new car here tonight but the one that gets God's attention is the one that their car is sitting up by the road about a half a mile from here and they had to walk the last half a mile in. But when they got in here, they're not having a pity party. They're not feeling sorry for themselves. They're not sitting around, moping around, wanting somebody else to do something for them. They come in here and made their mind up. I may have to walk home, but honey, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to magnify Him. The devil don't know what to do with somebody that worships God. No matter who or what is against them. Oh, pastor. Oh, pastor. She said something to me and it just took the life out of me. Then you didn't have much life in you. Oh, pastor, they didn't speak to me. Oh, pastor, they, they snubbed me at camp meeting. Well, are you here for them? Or are you here to magnify and glorify God? Yeah. 
Somebody shout amen. amen. Shout amen. amen. I just saw this the other day. You've probably known it for a thousand years. So allow me a little bit of folly here. Psalm chapter 100 verse number 4 said, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. When I was done reading that, my buddy, Brother Mark Foster, when I was done reading that, I put it into my computer program. I wanted to see all the places in the Bible that it talks about his courts. This is the only place. I wanted to find all the places in the Bible that talks about his gates. This is the only place. It's the only place in your Bible that his courts and his gates are ever mentioned. Gates are an opening in a wall. Gates and walls are put up to preserve and to protect and to be a covering for you. The courts is the throne room. That's where the king is. And he said, if you want my protection, if you want my, if, if you want me to preserve you, if you want me to cover you, you got to enter into my gates with thanksgiving and you got to enter into my courts. You want to be in the throne room? You you want to be in my presence the only way to do it is to praise I wish somebody that's had the Holy Ghost longer than that girl's been alive would get out there and run with her Poor old brother Lejeune. There he goes. He's taking a shortcut. He'd been out there cheerleading them all on. You're not 30 anymore, are you? You may be seated. I want you to know that one of the reasons we don't get the miracle we want, one of the reasons we don't get the deliverance that we need, one of the reasons that victory feels elusive to us is that we fall short of this thing called praise and worship and thanksgiving. Say, oh, Brother Cam, don't you see me? I'm on the back of one of these sections, got my, my arms crossed and my face is screwed up and I'm feeling all bad. Preacher, don't you know what I'm going through? I'm having me a little pity party here. You know what's bad about a pity party? Nobody goes to it. Nobody wants to attend. You're always by yourself. I'm tired. I'm tired of apostolics that as close as they can get to God is sucking their spiritual thumb and trying to get people to feel sorry for them. I got, I got something to tell you tonight. If you're here and you need victory in your marriage, if you need victory in your home, if you need victory in your mind, if you need spiritual victory, then I challenge you, no matter how you feel, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad it seems, I challenge you to worship God. Sit down. Several years ago, Gentry, we had a general conference service that I am telling you, people worship God for hours without stopping. It was unbelievable. They had Vincent Sinan, who lives close to me in Virginia Beach area, was then the president of, of the uh, Regent University there, the dean of students for Regent University. He was the author of this Pentecostal encyclopedia 
Brother Urshan was our general superintendent. He invited him to come to general conference to speak. And when Vincent Sinans came to the pulpit, he stood in front of the pulpit and he pulled a letter, a prepared letter, out of his pocket, opened it up, and laid it on the podium. And the first sentence of his letter, he said, I believe that you apostolic United Pentecostal Church people love the name of Jesus more than anybody on the face of the earth. Remember that? And honey, when he did, it was like a spiritual H-bomb went off in that place. I mean, people ran, they jumped, they danced, they shouted, they fell on the floor. Vincent Sinan stood there. He didn't know what to do. He just stood and watched us. Finally, Brother Urshan came out and said, okay, everybody sit down. Everybody hold, hold on. Stop, stop, stop. And he finally got them all sit down, patted Mr. Sinan on the back, said, now go ahead. And instead of starting where he left off, he said it again. I believe you United Pentecostal Church people love the name of Jesus more than anybody on the face of the earth. We never did put it back together. That was the end of the service. We had people that night that got healed. Blind eyes got open. People got up out of wheelchairs. And Gentry, your grandpa, he danced and shouted until he was a mess. He was soaking, dripping wet. I mean dripping wet. Necktie cost sideways, hair all messed up. He was a mess. And when, and, and when I was leaving the sanctuary, he come up and walked with me. He said, come on, Jack, let's go together. And we crossed the road and go in the hotel across from the headquarters hotel across from the auditorium there and he is so tired we go to the elevator get on the elevator and he goes back in the corner of the elevator over there i'm telling you he's so tired he just leans against it like that and then we had a pastor and his wife got on the elevator they looked like barbie and ken every hair in place Not a drop of sweat on him. His Bible matched her shoes. They got on that elevator and here's old brother Mangan just back there in the corner like he's oblivious to everything in the world. And they start talking. Wasn't that a bunch of foolishness tonight? We look so bad when we have guests and we act like that. That poor old guest didn't even get to speak. We had politicians there tonight that didn't get recognized. The preacher that prepared didn't get to preach. And all, and I'm thinking, I'm not making this up. Brother Mangan's in this corner. I thought, you know what? I'm going to back over here in this corner. I'm going to get as far from them as I can get in this elevator. He acted like he didn't even hear them. Act like nothing was going on. They run their mouth all the way up. Finally, we get to Brother Mangan's floor. He said, I'll see you, Jack. I said, yes, sir. We'll see you later. And I thought, Phew. Lucky them. He went out into the hallway, the door started back, and then all of a sudden, here come an arm in the door. Bang. And the doors opened up. And when those doors opened up, there's old brother Mangan standing there with his finger pointed. He said, you show me a church that don't worship God, and I'll show you a church that don't have babies. God shut Michael's womb for making fun of David worshiping God. You can say standing, but listen to me. I know we're high tech. 
I know we got great music. I know we have fabulous singers. I know we got awesome preachers. I know you came in a nice suit and came in a nice car, but you listen to me tonight. If we ever let the devil steal the worship from our church services, we're gonna lose the move of God. I got five camp meetings this summer. And one of them, the superintendent said, would you come in tomorrow for a minister's only session? Sit on a stool and just let them ask questions about revival. I said, sure, I will. One of the first questions they asked, how have you gone nearly three years with somebody getting the Holy Ghost every Sunday? I said, we preached on the Holy Ghost every Sunday for three years. You're not going to have people getting the Holy Ghost preaching on the silver sockets. My, 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 my. And then I was asked, you got to hear this, friend. I I promise you I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I want you to get this. I was asked, Brother Cunningham, what's the most important church growth tool you got? What's the most important church growth tool? And I answered him, just have good church. Just every time you come together, have a move of God. Every time you come together, entertain the presence of the Lord with your worship. You don't got to get all wrapped up in a bunch of other stuff to entertain this generation. Just have good church. Just have a move of God. Y'all still with me? I said, are y'all still with me? Paul and Silas, they're in the inner prison. Their backs are beaten to a bloody pulp. Their hands and their feet are bound in stocks and bonds. The jailer's been given the charge that if they get away, we're going to kill you and your family. Backs beaten, stocks and bonds, inner prison. Midnight hour, Paul and Silas said, why sit here and cry? Let's just worship God. And the Bible said in the midnight hour, they prayed and sang praises unto the Lord. Somebody needs to hear me. The midnight hour is the darkest hour of the night. And you may be going through the darkest hour of your life right now. You may be thinking, I'm looking up to see bottom. Everything that can go wrong is going wrong. The devil's come at me from every side. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, get through this. I don't know where victory's going to come from or if it's even going to come. But I've come to tell you that at the midnight hour, they prayed and sang praises unto God. Hold on. And while they were praising God, God sent an earthquake. And that old prison began to shake. And the Bible said that when God shook the prison, all the doors swung open wide and every man's bands was loosed. Preacher, that's what we need. We need a band breaking revival in our church. We need a prison door opening revival in our church. We need we need an old fashioned earthquake that'll come and shake our church. Can I tell you that worship is the answer? Worship is the answer. Worship is the answer. Worship is the answer. 
Somebody shout yes. yes. Shout yes. yes. Let's do it for two more minutes. Worship him with all your heart. Worship him with all your heart. No matter what you're going through, no matter how you feel, Are there any tongue talkers in this house? Would you praise him in tongues? Would you open up your mouth and let the spirit, let the spirit pray through you? My, 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 my. Does anybody feel what I'm feeling in this house? There is a Holy Ghost. There is a Holy Ghost move. There is a Holy Ghost saturation that's taking place right now. I wonder what it would sound like if everybody in this building clapped your hands with all your might and magnified God with all of your heart. Clap your hands, all you people! It feels like God's sending an earthquake. It feels like prison doors are opening up. It feels like bands are being loosed. This is, this is going to take a minute. Yeah, that's how I feel. This is going to take a minute. I want everybody that's in the altar to move back. Would you do that? Kind of go back to where you come from. Go back to your seat, if you will. Give me this whole altar open. The whole altar. Now I want every pastor that's in this house to start out from where you are. I don't care if you're in a balcony, find the closest stairs. I want every pastor in this building to come fill this altar area. Every pastor. There's fixing to be an impartation. Holy God. He kahata. Some of you have been fighting with the beast of Ephesus, but it's going to stop tonight. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's going to stop tonight. Every pastor. Everybody listen up. I am so thankful for you men, women. You're the heroes. Sometimes unsung heroes. I'm thankful for every one of you 
that serve the church of God faithfully. That serve the church of God willingly. That serve the church of God unselfishly. Church, would you give these pastors a great hand? There is not one day, tomorrow will be one week, there's not one day in the last week that I've not prayed for Louisiana preachers, Louisiana pastors. I know I'm superintendent of a district, but I've been praying for Louisiana pastors for a week. You're not the only camp I'm preaching. I got five of them I'll be in this summer. But God, God put you in my heart. God put you in my heart. And I know not one of you has talked to, not a single human here has talked to me. I know Kevin Cox, my dear friend, and some of my other friends here probably th- thought I backslid. But when I came in here last night, I stayed in my room. Stayed in my room all day today. Sought God. Brother Kleindens come over and talked to me and really helped me today. Helped me tremendously today while we talked about the things of God. But I deliberately stayed away. Not nobody. Nobody has talked to me. But let me tell you what I know in the Holy Ghost. Some of you are fighting depression and discouragement like you've never fought before in your lifetime. Some of you are thinking, I'm not qualified. I don't have the qualifications that it's going to take to have the kind of church I want to have. I don't have the kind of anointing that it's going to take. I don't have the pulpit ability that other people have. Some of you are being beat up. There's people that are talking about you. The enemies attacked your marriage and the enemies attacked your children and has attacked your families. And some of you, the enemy has attacked your church. And some of you, you've seen things out of people in the last few weeks and months that you thought was impossible. You've been dealing with things you've never had to deal with before. And I'm telling you after one week of talking to God about you and fasting and praying God told me it's going to stop tonight there's going to be an impartation of the Holy Ghost upon Louisiana pastors and it's going to happen tonight ha my God my God my God I live in Virginia. More presidents have come from our state than any state. We have Monticello. We have the Pentagon. We have Arlington National Cemetery. Our campground is in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley. You preached it last year. It is history. You can't go 10 feet without running into history. Our campground was started, a a military school that was started the year after the Civil War ended. We're 30 minutes from Monticello where Jefferson's house is. We're just surrounded by history. I was visiting an old Civil War fort. And while we're going around the inside of that courtyard, Brother Mangan, there's a great big mound of dirt higher than the outside walls in the middle of that courtyard. Somebody asked the guide, what's that mound of dirt for? He said they put a sharpshooter on top of that mound of dirt he could see over the walls and they put a guy with a long telescope on his shoulder and he said their job was they weren't allowed to shoot a private they weren't allowed to shoot a corporal they weren't allowed to shoot a sergeant Their job was to scan the enemy line. And every time they found an officer, they'd zero in on the officer. And their job with that long rifle from that little hilltop was to take out the officer. Because they understood a biblical principle that if you smite the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter. And if we take out the officer, then those soldiers are going to be without leadership. Can I tell the church of the living God in the great state of Louisiana and there is no other church like you. But can I tell you tonight that these men that are around this altar right now need you to back them up.
They need you to back them up with prayer. They need you to have their back. When somebody else starts running their mouth about your preacher, put your hand behind your ear and say, let me hear you say that again. Because as soon as you're done, I'm going to call him and tell him you said it. Exactly right. Exactly right. They need your loyalty. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care how disloyal our day is. You hear me tonight. Do we want to be an apostolic church or do we not? If we want to be an apostolic church, we can't conduct ourselves in a mindset of worldliness. I told God today, and this is dangerous, I said, God, I'll walk away from my notes and do whatever you tell me to do. And that's dangerous. But listen to me. The apostolic church has always been a counter culture church. We aren't supposed to look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, think like the world, be disloyal like the world. I ain't giving you my paycheck back. But I don't care. I wouldn't give you two cents for a man or woman disloyal to their pastor. Amen. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how you can talk, how you can sing, how you can play, how you can teach, how sharp you, it don't matter. If you're not loyal to your preacher, you're not apostolic. Say amen. Amen. Or oh me. We've got to make our minds up. Our pastor feeds us, loves us, prays for us, fights hell for us, leads us, challenges us, empowers us, get a word from God for us. And do they deserve anything less than our prayer, our love, and our support. Now listen to me. You don't get credit for that because that's the most pitiful hand clap I ever heard in my lifetime. I don't care if your pastor's 20 years old and learning how to pastor on you, you be a good teacher. Or if he's 100 years old and on oxygen, you be loyal to him. I'm getting tired of going to churches and camps that you can jive and bebop with the music and sit there like a knot on a log while the man of God's preaching his guts out. We only come to church for one reason, and that's to hear what thus saith the Lord. It's the most important thing that happens here. Y'all wouldn't want me as your pastor. I got a lot of saints watching right now. So they're going to hear me say this down here. But I got a rule in the church I pastor. If you don't shout with the preacher, you ain't allowed to shout with the choir. You stay in your seat. We got another rule in my church. If you don't shout with your pastor... You ain't allowed to shout with the guest preacher. That's right. He kotoshe katata la 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 mahanda yada bahataya. 
I know I'm being ornery right now, but I want you to know that I magnify the ministry. I want every pastor and every man and woman of God to know that your position in the kingdom of God has never been more critical. There's never been a day that we, we more needed men and women of God than we do today. There's never been a day in our history that we need a divine direction, that we need anointed men and anointed women that'll take the lead among us. And for them to take the lead all of us have got to be willing to follow. The youth division called me in my room today. They got me preaching one night at North American Youth Congress. I asked them when they called. Y'all know how old I am, right? But today they called and said, who's your pastor? We want your pastor to introduce you. I said, well, I'm tough on pastors. My grandpa's my first one, he died, and Billy Cole's my second one, he died. I considered Merle my pastor, and Merle died, then Brother Haney, and he died. I'm tough on pastors, folks. So I asked Brother Stone King. I said, would you be my pastor? One of my Uncle Bill's lifelong friends. I thought he'll be a good one. He ain't ever pastored. I'm the only saint he's got. (laughs) And he calls me on the phone. He'll say, boy, this is your pastor calling. (laughs) I'm telling you folks. You hear this preacher. I hope Brother Stone King hears it and tries me. There ain't nothing that man can call me and ask me to do today that I won't try to do it. I'll try my best to do it. I believe he's a man of God. I believe he hears from God. And if you've got a preacher that knows how to hear from God, if you've got a preacher that's anointed, if you've got a preacher that goes to the pulpit with a thus saith the Lord word from God, honey, that's more important in your life than in anything else you've got. Now, if Mark wouldn't have made you shout last night, I'd do different tonight. But I felt like when he was done, that let me off the hook to minister to these precious men of God. We're about, we're about that far away, not from a Jack Cunningham impartation, but from a Holy Ghost impartation that's going to fall, going to fall, going to fall heavy on every one of you. Put your hands in the air right now and just say the words, I receive it. Say the words, I receive it. I receive it. The Holy Ghost impartation. Church, would you raise your hands toward every man of God that's standing around the front of this church? I receive it! I want every preacher to throw your head back and I want you to begin to speak with other tongues with authority. With authority. Speak with other tongues with authority. We have to identify what a Christian is, what a Christian truly really is. Now, if I were to ask you, hey, brother or sister, what is a Christian or what does the word Christian mean? I'm not going to ask you because I'm afraid you might tell me it means Christ-like. If you tell me the word Christian means Christ-like, all that simply means is you never looked it up. 
He didn't look in the dictionary or the lexicon. And my mama taught Susie, my sister and I, don't use words you haven't looked up because you might be using the word wrong. So the word Christian does not mean Christ-like. On page 672, column 1, paragraph 3 of the Greek-English lexicon of New Testament words by Joseph Henry Thayer, he said the word Christian is from the Greek word Christianos, and it means follower and worshiper of Jesus Christ. A Christian is somebody who follows and worships Jesus, because in reality, we don't know nobody just like Jesus. Jesus Christ has never been duplicated and never been replicated. A follower and a worshiper of Jesus is a Christian. So the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You serve the God that you worship. I can hang out with anybody. That's why Evangelist Green, it was a treat to hang out with you. I can hang out with anybody 20 minutes. I will tell you who your God is because you serve the gods you worship. If you worship money, you serve your business or your job or whatever you do to get money. If you worship fashion, you serve clothes. If you worship education, you serve degrees. If you worship knowledge, you serve science. If you worship your body, you serve exercise. If you worship your belly, you serve food. If you worship lust, you serve sex. If you worship getting high, you serve alcohol. If you worship yourself, you serve pride. If you worship sin, you serve the devil. Let me admonish you, worship God and serve Jesus. Jesus is the only legitimate object of worship in the entire world. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow.